morning and welcome to church. Whether you're joining us online or in person at one of our great campuses, your presence here means a lot to us and we're so thankful to have you with us today. I wanna take a moment and ask you for a really important favor. If you're in person today, please grab one of our connection cards, take it back to our next step table and get your gift today. We wanna make sure that you leave here with some cookies and some good things for you and your family. Well, with that, we got a lot of great things going on at Inspire Church. You're gonna hear a lot more about that. But before we get into anything else, we are gonna worship Jesus today. So stand up on your feet right where you're at. Yes, you watching right now, stand up. Let's get ready to worship the King of Kings. Good morning. Worship him today. Are you ready to give him all that he deserves? Come on, put your hands together. Morning, everybody. Guys. How are you guys doing this morning? Woo, it's good it to see you good guys to alive. See you guys. Wow, you guys get extra bonus points for being here yes. on Time Change Sunday, right? Big. That's big, a big deal. deal. Big deal. How I many mean, of you, when the alarm went off this morning, you're like, ugh? Yeah. 
Just me? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, welcome. If this is your first time, we are so glad you could be here with us. We have a great, great gift for you in our guest center back there. All you got to do is just grab this little connect card in the seat back in front of you and fill it out. And you bring it to the person back there, and we would love to give you a nice little gift. And then also on here, as many of you know, there's a place to put a prayer request. And so, as you know, many of our staff, all of our pastoral staff, yep. every single yep. week they go over these. And they take these very, very seriously, right? You guys yep. pray over them, right? Yep. Yep. You dedicate a lot of time. We reach out a lot. Right? People. I yep. know we as a person who attends this church, it's nice that if when I've got a prayer request that I know that I'm not alone and I just I just got to write it down on here and put it in any of the giving boxes and I got a great pastoral staff that's going to pray over with me and for me and yeah. through it all and it's just awesome so I really encourage you guys to do that yeah what don't else? do life alone no. um, also some of our next step tables and our inspired groups table in the back we'd love for you to check those out baptisms are coming up we have Woo! a couple other things that are coming up that we would love for you to get engaged with so if you're ready to take your next step in your journey with Jesus go check yeah. out the resources resources back there. We have them there on purpose so that you continue to grow. Yeah. Well, this morning, will you guys join me in praying this morning? Let's invite Jesus into this place because I don't know about you, but I need him more than I need anything else this morning. Yeah. So will you join me in praying? Father God, we just want to thank you this morning that God, your presence is in this place. And that God, before we even walked into this room, that God, you have prepared this morning for us. And God, as we worship you this morning, I pray that God, this would be a sweet fragrance to you. As we worship you this morning, that God, you would inhabit the praises of your people. God, we welcome you here. God, do whatever you want and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all got it in you this morning to learn a new song? Oh, All right, yes. well, sing it along with us if you know it. It's called Firm Foundation. How many believe that Christ is our firm foundation? Amen. 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 Jesus today. Come on.
going to go into a time of communion, guys. If you guys will, um, get your communion elements out. If you don't have any, just raise your hands. We have some ushers in the back that can bring those to you right now. But we just sang about the faithfulness of God. And I don't know about you, but that is one quality that I've known my father to always have. He's always there for me. He didn't have to go to the cross, but he chose to to fulfill something so that our sins could be forgiven. So no matter where you're at this morning, we have something to celebrate because of what he did, not because of what we did. That's good news, guys. That's good news. It isn't built on us. So as we take these communion elements this morning, if you'll get your bread out and get it out ready. It says that, when Jesus was sitting at a table with his disciples, he took a bread and he broke it and he passed it around the table. And he said, this, is my, this represents my body, which was broken for you. Every time you guys are together and you break this bread, do it in remembrance of what I have done for you. This morning, let's remember the body that was broken for us by taking this together this morning. took a cup and he said this cup it represents a new covenant thank goodness for that new covenant a covenant which is that my blood will be shed for your sins that you will be made white as snow because of this cup and what what it represents and every time you guys are together and you drink from this cup remember what I have done for you this morning we, we take this together guys and remember what he's done This morning. I thank you that God you did. You you got on that cross because you knew every person's name in this room and that you wanted a relationship with him. And you knew that the only way for that to happen was for you to go on that cross and to die and then to be raised again. And we celebrate that this morning, God. We thank you for your faithfulness. You did what you said you would, and you were faithful to the end. And now we get an opportunity for our sins to be washed away so that we can be in eternity with you. God, I pray this morning that, God, our hearts would yearn for you this morning. God, I pray that you would be with us this morning, that, God, your spirit would continue to move in this place. Speak to our hearts. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our midst. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see your smiling faces. You can be seated. I'm so glad you guys are here. There's going to be buckets that are going to be passed around. You can drop off your, uh, your trash into that. Um, but we have so many things that are going to be going on here, and there's so many that I can't remember them all. So we're going to take a look at this video screen here behind me, and we're going to share with you what's going on here at Inspire Church. We're so glad you're here. Let's check out what we have coming up. I want to tell you about a couple of cool ministries at Inspire Church. We have our Inspire Free Clothing Room, as well as a ministry that we've connected with that gives out showers in a shower trailer. If you want to be a part of those to help with those, or if you're in need of those ministries, uh, check out your information booth after the service. Hey ladies, join us for the upcoming Women's Conference, March 15 and 16 over in Yakima. Get registered today. Hey, are you grieving the loss of a loved one? Well, we have a class on Mondays called Grief Share at the Cedar Woolley Campus at 5 p.m. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey, Inspire Kids, we have a pizza party for you coming up March 24th, Palm Sunday. Hope to see you there. Senior Saints, don't forget Wednesday midday, 2 o'clock. Every Wednesday we have a senior service, especially for you. It, 
you need to be there. It's a great time. We also, on the 15th of the month, the third Friday, going to have our great senior lunch, going to have a lot of fun and a lot of good food. I uh, want you to come bring a white elephant so we have something to add to our prize pile. And I, I have made up my mind that I am going to give. Hey, Inspire, I would love to have you join me for our Inspire Church Family Nights, taking place every Wednesday at 7 p.m. at our Cedro Woolley campus. Bring the family, invite a friend. We have groups and classes for all ages. I can't wait to see you there. Hey, Inspire Church, I want to invite you out to a couple of really important things that are coming up. First and foremost, on March 17th at 1 p.m., it's our annual business meeting and annual celebration. Come on out to that meeting for a free lunch, and we're going to celebrate all that God has done and look forward into the next year together. I also want to mention to you that Easter weekend is coming up. We have a Good Friday service, Easter egg hunts, and Easter Sunday services for you and your family on every single campus. Don't miss this opportunity to invite someone that you know, and we'll see you there. God bless you guys. There's a little something for everyone. For more information, check us out on social media or icskagetvalley.org. Bye. All right, well, we're going to get ready to pray over the tithes and offerings here in just a minute. There's a lot of ministry here that goes on at Inspire Church and through Inspire Church, and those ministries are producing good fruit and those ministries are made possible due in large part because of your guys' faithfulness and giving and tithing. So thank you guys for that, and thank you for being a part of that. But as a regular giver or if you're working toward that or thinking about being a, a good uh, giver or a faithful and regular giver, one of the things that you want to do is, in being a good steward of what God has entrusted you with is making sure that wherever you're giving to, whether that's Inspire Church or somewhere else, it's also a good steward of that money, which is God's money. And so in doing that, a few ways you can do that. One, we just mentioned, make sure that where you're giving is producing good fruit. Another way is to get involved, volunteer and be involved in some of those ministries so that you can see it for yourself and see what God is doing with those, with those tithes and offerings. And lastly, once a year, we have our annual business meeting. That's going to be next Sunday after church. You can come and hear a little bit more in detail about what we're doing and celebrate some of those things that God is doing. So I just want to encourage you to not just be a faithful giver, but be an educated giver. And I think if you make yourself an educated giver, you'll be more excited and more encouraged to give. Amen. A few ways you can give here at Inspire Church. If you want to give in person, we have giving boxes. There's a few on the back wall, one out in the foyer, a few other ones scattered around the building. They say giving box right on them. You can't miss it. You can also put your connect cards in those. Besides that, we have a text to give system. You can text any dollar amount to that number, 84321. Punch in some information. After you do that, you just text any dollar amount to that number. It makes it sim super simple to do that. We have online giving on our church website. Lastly, you can mail a check into the church office at 805 Township. One other way that we don't have scroll on there, but I use it and I love it. There's some QR codes in the seat back in front of you. One of them takes you to the church website. The other one takes you to the church app. If you do the church app one, I think it's the one that doesn't have the box around it. It's awesome. It has the church calendar on there. You can give on there. Everything all in one spot on the app. Real super simple and convenient. So I want to encourage you to at least check that out. But let's pray together this morning over the tithes and offerings. God, we just thank you, God, for what you've entrusted us with, God. We just thank you, God, that as we are faithful, God, givers, God, to you, that we're seeing good fruit produced, God, through this through this church, God, that we're seeing people inspired to follow you through this church in Skagit County, God, and we give you all the praise and glory for it. We pray for these tithes and offerings this morning that you continue to do that, continue to open doors for us to see your kingdom grown through us, and we just ask these things this morning in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Inspire Church. How's everybody doing this morning? 
that is a Time Change Sunday response right there. Hey, welcome to Time Change Sunday, also known as Church Online Sunday. So I want to say thank you to those of you, whatever campus you're on this morning, thank you for rising from the bed because Christ rose from the dead. Amen. That's a good thing. I want to say thank you for being here. Can we hear it for our LaConnor campus this morning? Can we just go crazy for those guys? Awesome, awesome work that's happening out there. As a matter of fact, this week, uh, some how many of you know it's been a little windy around here lately? A couple trees blew over and messed up the fence. I love that congregation who are working together to cut those trees down, to take care of that and put the fence back up. I talked to Pastor Matt and said, hey, how much do you think that's going to cost? He said, oh, we're just going to take care of it. And I was like, I love that. So shout out to LaConnor. Thank you for being legit. They're awesome. Yeah, one more time. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And then I also want to welcome our Burlington campus this morning. Can we go crazy for Burlington this morning? We had the great chance to hear from Pastor Ryan, our Burlington campus pastor, last Sunday. And Burlington, I'm, I'm just letting you know I'm glad that he's back with you today. And maybe more importantly, Grace is back with you today. So that's a good thing. Uh, it is great to be a part of a multi-site church. And how many of you know that to follow Jesus in a healthy way, you got to be a part of a healthy church family? Amen. And speaking of being a part of a healthy church family, that means that we work together, that we hurt together, that we pray together. And so I want to let you know that this Saturday at 2 p.m. is a memorial service for my dear friend Ralph Clark. Janice, his wife, is wanting to invite anybody that would like to come to that. That'll be right here at the Cedro Woolley campus this Saturday at 2 p.m. If you want to come and celebrate the life of Ralph Clark with us, that would be amazing. And with that, can we go ahead and open this time with a word of prayer? And I want to pray for the Clark family and all other needs this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, Jesus, thank you for today. Lord, thank you first and foremost, God, that we get to be a part of a multi-site church, God, that's reaching the valley for your kingdom today. Lord, I thank you that on Time Change Sunday, Lord, that we get a head start on everybody else as churchgoers, Lord. We have a, a leg up. We're getting used to the new schedule today versus Monday. Lord, we thank you for the energy that you're going to bring into our bones and our souls this week. Lord, I, I pray today, God, that you would anoint every single thing that's said and done at every single campus today. Lord, I pray, God, for the Clark family. Lord, thank you for Ralph and a life that was incredibly well lived. I pray for his wife, Janice. Lord, I pray for his daughters, God, and their whole family. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that we get to walk alongside such champions of the faith. God, we bless you today, Lord. I pray that as we shift our focus to your word this morning, that you would anoint every word that is spoken, that you would move me out of the way. In Jesus' name, if you're in agreement, shout out amen this morning. Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 says, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Somebody say, I got my belt on. You know, I wear a belt all the time. It just feels better. I don't know how to explain that. I feel like it holds things in. You know what I'm saying? Like it holds the chubbiness in. It kind of helps me. I tuck my shirt in. You know that you're reaching the middle age of life when you like to tuck your shirt in. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So that's a good thing. But, but I, I think about this idea of, of wearing a belt of truth and what that means. And today we're going to talk about fearless boldness, this idea that we are called to be fearlessly bold. And I think that there's something to this about living and operating in the truth of God's word while also standing upon the grace of who Jesus is. Our big idea today is that it's important for us to be fearlessly bold for God's truth no matter what is going on around us. Can I get an amen to that? See, the truth is, is that we will either stand in truth or we will fall in fear. And God wants us to stand up to an evil culture and say that we are following Jesus no matter what happens to us. Are you with me today, church? So why is it important to be fearlessly bold for the truth? Well, in Matthew 10, 32 to 33, Jesus speaks these words really to Christian believers, to us even. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. How many, how many of you remember maybe being a little bit younger when you first started praying and maybe you developed a habit of praying when you went out to eat or when you were eating a meal and you got to the school cafeteria and you felt like you wanted to pray but you were a little worried about what somebody else might think about you. That's where we need fearless boldness. Can I tell you, friends, people need to know that there are still Christians who love Jesus like crazy on this side of the country. People need to know that there are still people who are radically in love with Jesus. And it makes me think about Daniel, who stood up for God's word even in the midst of great danger, ridicule, and an unbiblical culture. 
Think about this for a moment. In Daniel chapter 6, we're told the story of Daniel. And just a reminder, last week you heard Pastor Ryan talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Hebrew. That's what I like to call him because he's a bad man. Uh, and he talked about them and how they were carried off into exile into Babylon. Well, fast forward quite a few more years, and Daniel is a high-ranking government official. And this crazy decree comes down. As a matter of fact, there's this statue that's built on the plain of Dura, and it was 60 cubits high and six, and six or nine cubits wide, which basically means 90 feet tall. I always think of Lord Farquaad from Shrek, Shrek for some reason when I think of when I think of King Nebuchadnezzar. Like he was, I think he was short. That's why I had to build this humongous statue of himself. That's just an opinion. That's not biblical. It's just it's from the NJT, the New Josh translation this morning. But what I will say is something happened in Daniel chapter 6. There's a decree given that when the music starts to play, everybody will bow down and worship this statue. And there's also other statements that you can't pray to anybody else. And I love in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Now I love this idea that these guys are saying, hey, we're not going to bow down to a statue. We're not going to stop praying to God. This decree, don't pray to your God. We're not going to stop standing for what is right. We're not going to stop standing in truth. And listen to this. Daniel didn't mind so much getting moved from his home country. He didn't protest at that. He didn't make a stand on getting his name changed. You know what ticked Daniel off enough to make a stand? Was when they started to mess with the laws of God. See, our culture today is telling us to come and bow down to their beliefs. Our culture is saying that we have to conform to these things. And like Daniel, we must never back down from God's truth. Somebody say amen. See, to stand courageously for the truth of God's word, we need to know the difference between how God thinks and how the world thinks. And this is called a worldview. Somebody say worldview. What is a worldview? It's the, it's the beliefs that you build your life upon. It's the lens through which you view everything. It's how you see God, yourself, others, your family, Satan, life, death, past, present, work, future, problems, suffering, all of it. Everything. It's how we view everything. And the problem today is a lot of Christians have a non-Christian worldview because they got it from the world and not the word. See, I read an article this week. And I was actually a little bit surprised by it. In this article, it made this statement that Seattle and the surrounding metro area is the least church metropolis in the country. I also read that less people per capita believe in God in the state of Washington than any other state this week. I honestly didn't know that. Now, I knew that that we live in an area that loves to justify their own actions and sinfulness. I knew that we live in an area where people are standing opposed to God, but I did not know that it was actually quite that bad. And what I want to say to you today is that Christian believers in Jesus must choose to have a biblical worldview. And yet we are more biblically illiterate than we've ever been. We have more access to gaining knowledge and wisdom than any previous generation, and yet on Time Change Sunday, we're too tired. (laughs) Come on. Friends, can I tell you something today? We have to stand in the gap that nobody else is willing to stand in. And I want to talk to you about some pretty controversial things. You have your belt on today? We're going to stand upon the belt of truth today. We're going to put on the belt of truth. We're going to tighten it up, and we're going to clarify some things today. And yes, some might be offended by the words I'm about to speak, but I'm not worried about offending people as much as I'm worried about making a stand for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not preaching this message to be offensive, but sometimes the gospel is offensive. And where God stands offends people who want to stand against him. Are you with me today? So I want to cover today four popular anti-Christian worldviews because we are continually bombarded with these worldviews in classrooms, in books, in movies, in music, in media, in advertising, and everything else. So I want to combat some of these things today. The first popular anti-Christian worldview today is materialism. Anybody like money? Come on, somebody. Materialism. And this says what matters most is money. 
It says that life is about acquisition, getting more and more, that he who dies with the most toys wins. Friends, he who dies just dies. It's just true. Jesus taught a different worldview. In Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus said, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Listen, can I tell you today, it's this simple. The greatest things in life are not things. And your self-worth is not based on your net worth. And your value is not based on your valuables. Materialism is flawed because it says if I just get one more thing, I will feel better about my life. Friends, all you will do is get into more and more debt and you will feel worse about your soul. Materialism is a problem. The second anti-Christian worldview today is hedonism, which is the idea that whatever feels good is good. In this worldview, pleasure is the sole goal of life. Fun, thrills, partying. What matters most is how you feel. The number one goal is comfort. I remember watching a commercial many years ago and it was somebody, this, this guy, and he looked kind of fancy and he was in a fancy house and he was kind of, I guess, getting out of the shower. He's wearing a bathrobe and then it showed him in a nice suit and then it showed him in a beautiful kitchen and then it showed him getting into a car and the commercial said, you get out of your luxury shower. You go to your luxury kitchen to get your lu luxury cup of coffee. You come out of your luxury house and you step into your luxurious vehicle. And it was all about this idea that this is the thing that's going to make you feel good, is buying this stupid car that massages your back for you for the low price of $75,000 MSRP. Come on, somebody. And then we are tricked into believing that if I just get more stuff, I'm going to feel better. Listen, your back might feel a little bit better, but your soul will not. You can be a hedonist and not even know it. If your number one goal is always comfort or retirement or happiness, you're missing it. Listen, the wisest and wealthiest man who ever lived concluded this in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 17. King Solomon, the Bible declared him as the wisest and wealthiest man who's ever lived. He says, are you addicted to thrills? What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. This guy had it all. He had everything that you can get, and yet he said, it's not really worth it. Look at the person next to you, tell him it ain't worth it. Look at the person on the other side, tell him it definitely ain't worth it. It just ain't worth it. <laughs> just because it's fun or pleasurable doesn't make it right. In Hebrews 11, in what we call the Hall of Faith, the writer of Hebrews says, Moses chose to suffer with God's people rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Moses is a perfect example of this idea of not falling into hedonism. He said, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm not going to just be a prince of Egypt. I'm going to be somebody that God can use in my life. Hedonism, not a good thing. The third anti-Christian worldview is individualism. And this means what I want comes first. It's a me-first mentality. It's a self-centered lifestyle. Listen, America is, is addicted to self-interest today. As a matter of fact, we have a culture of narcissism. I remember when I first noticed people started taking selfies, and I never understood it. Listen, some of you in this very room at our campuses today, you know how to do duck lips. I, I don't. But yet that's the kind of society that we have. Because if you go on your social media right now, a good-looking person who's posting for a selfie will get more likes than a story of somebody who's inspiring masses. Because we live in a narcissistic society. Have you ever realized how products are marketed to your narcissism? You wake up. You pick up your iPhone, which is next to your iPad, which is next to your iWatch. And then you think to yourself, it's all about I. <laughs> There's a commercial pitch for you. Think about it. YouTube and back in the day, MySpace. Anybody still have a MySpace hanging around? I want my pictures back, MySpace. You took them. So listen, every ad plays to your self-interest. Obey your thirst. Have it your way. But listen, God did not create you to live for yourself. It's not about you and your me phone or whatever you have. It's about what God wants to do. And yet this world says just be self-centered. Proverbs 18.1 says it's selfish and stupid to think only of yourself. 
This is tough, but look at the person next to you and tell them, don't be that guy or girl, whatever. God sent Jesus to model how to live, by the way. Philippians 2, 4 to 5, each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Friends, I hope that our attitude today is the same as that of Christ Jesus. It's not about my own self-interest. It's not about what I want to accomplish. It's not about what I want to do in my life. It's about what Jesus wants to do. And if you're ready to get really offended today, this fourth worldview will do it for you. The fourth worldview is the opposite of individualism, and it's the idea of socialism, which says the government should control everything. Now, by the way, I think government is a good thing scripturally. In fact, government was instituted by God because God is not an anarchist. God says everything should be done decently and in order, which requires some form of governance. But people who do not know God like to make government God because somebody has to be in control. Are you with me today? What is the biblical purpose of government? To protect freedom, to ensure justice, to preserve peace. Jesus explained government's limited role, and its role is not to play God. Jesus said in response to a question about paying taxes, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. In other words, there is a place for government, but there is also a place for God. I used to pastor a church in Southern California, and one of the people that went there was always very much into the idea of being a socialist. And I would have conversations with them of clarifying worldviews and things like that and talking about what Jesus said and why he said it. And they never quite bought into what scripture teaches because they were so stuck in a toxic compassion and charity. And this week I noticed that they posted something about how the forefathers made sure to keep religion out of government. And I always laugh at that because at least 75% of our constitution is absolutely 100% biblical. And I always laugh at that because if you go back into the original writings, the intent was never to shield the government from religion. The intent was to shield religion from the government. Listen, as an American, I believe that if you want to be stupid and live against God's word, you should have the right to do that. Because I want the freedom to say that you're stupid. <laughs> and listen, it's okay. I'm saying this in jest. But genuinely, Christians, I am not called to control somebody else with my worldview. But I am called to my worldview. Just like nobody else should be called to defend their worldview or force their worldview upon what we believe about God's word. But yet that's what we see happening in our culture today. Friends, there's examples in the Bible of when you must choose God over government. Now, I'm not a very rebellious person by nature. As a matter of fact, we were one of those churches that during the whole COVID season, we tried to find the middle ground between the insanity of what we were being told to do and the reality of people that we're trying to serve. And so we tried to walk that middle ground, being respectful to those that are in authority over us while being sensible about how to reach people. But the reason why I'm talking about you or about this to you today is we need to think for ourselves. Friends, we need to understand that God's word is more important than our government, that our Christian belief is more important than our politics, that what we believe about who God is and who we are and who people are trumps the authority of our government in our hearts and minds. You are a citizen of heaven before you're a citizen of anything else. See, there's an example in the book of Acts chapter 5 where the apostles and disciples rejected government counsel. The Jerusalem City Council tried to stop the spread of the gospel. In Acts 5, 28 to 29, they said this to the apostles. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. They're talking about the name of Jesus, by the way. And then Peter and the other apostles replied in verse 29 of Acts 5, we must obey God rather than men. Come on, church. That's an amen moment. It doesn't mean that we're trying to be anti-government or we're not. Listen, I don't want to be crazy in here. Are you with me today? But it means that we understand where everybody's roles go. And these four worldviews that I'm sharing with you today, it's incredibly important that we understand, friends, that materialism, hedonism, 
individualism and socialism have no place in a Christian's heart. Because all of these unhealthy worldviews lead us to the following. If you have your notes this morning, these, there's a lot of writing here. You ready for this? Number one is the crumbling of our culture. And we're seeing that today. As our culture continues to say it's all about me, it's all about government, it's all about comfort, it's all about feeling good, our culture is crumbling around us. It will create crisis in our schools. We're seeing that very much so. It will create controversies in our courts because who gets to identify what right and wrong is? It will create corruption in our businesses. It will create chaos in our government. Friends, if you don't think there's chaos in our government, you don't watch the news ever because it's chaotic. It's actually embarrassing. <laughs> it creates carnality in our churches where Christians are more concerned with these worldviews than following Jesus. It creates confusion in our families, and it also creates conflicts in our personal lives. Friends, we need to learn that doing it the world's way is not doing it God's way. We need to do it God's way. So I'm going to share three unpopular truths in God's worldviews with you today, because this is where you need fearless boldness the most. There are many aspects of a biblical worldview that everyone agrees with. Like, nobody ever argues with us as a church when we're like, hey, listen, we want many of our campuses to be compassion hubs where we feed and clothe people. Everybody's like, that's a great idea. But then when we stand upon some of the things in God's word they don't agree with, they're like, you guys are terrible. We were cool a minute ago. Nobody disagrees with feeding the hungry, helping the poor, telling the truth, treating everyone with respect, defending the defenseless, protecting those that can't protect themselves. You know, all these ideas that our Constitution fights for. Nobody has a problem with those things. There's not controversy with much of what God says in his word. But when God's truth clashes with materialism, hedonism, or individualism, or even socialism, it is considered politically incorrect. And that's when we need to be fearlessly bold while also being loving. See, a lot of people try to pick and choose which of God's truth they believe. That's quite presumptuous for a people that were created and designed by a God who does lord over them, whether we like it or not. Listen, let me put it this way. Truth is always true. If it was truly true a thousand years ago, it's still true today. And you can't break God's laws because they will break you. An example is even scientific laws. If you tell me today that you don't believe in gravity, I will take you to the Empire State Building and see how much you believe what you say you believe. Because God's laws are unbreakable. So where do you need boldness to stand for truth? Just to mention three of the most hated truths in God's word really quickly. Number one is the sanctity of life. By, by the way, anybody super offended yet today? You guys hanging in there with me? Listen, we're not afraid to preach God's truth here at our church, but we want to make sure that we treat people with love and respect. Amen? I'm bold from the pulpit because I need to be, but when I'm talking to somebody that stands opposed to this worldview, I say, hey, I appreciate your perspective. I just disagree with it 100%. It's okay for us to say that. Some of you are like, Pastor, it feels like conflict. It is. It is an eternal conflict between good and evil. And it is happening in our day and age. The sanctity of life. And this states that God has a purpose for every unborn child. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. You, Lord, made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Your workmanship is marvelous. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every planned day of my life was recorded in your book and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Listen, I want you to hear today that God plans your life before you were ever even born. God had a purpose for you. Now you might have messed some of that up but I got news for you. God plans around our stupidity. And I'm so thankful for that. Because any, any of the rest of you ever been dumb before? Just me? Okay. Okay. I, yeah, all of us have. But God has planned around our mistakes and failures. And he's had a plan for us since before we were ever born. And friends, because of the idea of the sanctity of life, this is why our church is getting proactive this year. This is why we're launching a new ministry called Embrace Grace here at Inspire which will partner with moms who have considered having an abortion. 
And we're putting our money where our mouth is because we will show up with support groups, training classes. We will throw every single one of them a baby shower, getting them whatever they need and partnering with them even after the baby is born to love them to Jesus. Friends, that ministry is starting right now in our church, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. As a matter of fact, yesterday, Nicole and some of the gals from our church threw a baby shower for Pastor Johnny Dean's wife, Alicia, and Alicia and Johnny probably don't know this, but they were like the, the, the test run of can we pull off very high-quality baby showers in a systematic way and invite different people to them. And, and it was a great baby shower. I went over at the end of it and looked at the cake and decided not to have any because I'm trying to have self-control. But it looked good, and everything went well, and it was awesome. And, friends, the thing is, is if we believe something, then we need to compassionately live for it. If we believe that life is sacred, then we need to put our money where our mouth is and stand in the gap for that. Are you with me today? The second controversial worldview in Scripture that I want to talk to you about today is the sanctity of sex. Somebody say, uh-oh. Somebody's like, it's time change Sunday. I did not know we were talking about this today. I know. You, you guys will be fine. And the idea here is that sex is only for marriage. Oh, that's a weak amen. <laughs> this is not my opinion. It's in the owner's manual. Remember, sex was God's idea. And personally, I think he's smart. <laughs> he's got this thing figured out. And listen, I've seen over and over and over again, when we step outside of God's purpose and plan and intent, how painful it is for those that are hurting. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Listen, friends, God is a God of justice. And there will be a day where we have to stand and say, Okay, this is what I did with the life that you gave me. I want to be clear with you about the idea of the sanctity of sex. God's instructions have never changed. Premarital sex is unacceptable to God. Always has been and always will be. Living together outside of marriage is unacceptable to God. Always has been, always will be. Adultery always has been and always will be. Listen, homosexual sexual practices always have been and always will be. Pornography always has been and always will be outside of what God has described as healthy and good for humanity. Listen, some people say, hey, pastor, don't worry. We're practicing safe sex. There is no condom to protect your heart. And I'm telling you as your pastor, as your friend, as someone who cares about you, I've dealt with years and years and years of pain and trauma in people's lives because they've missed this. By the way, if you are guilty of any of these, Inspire Church is the place for you because we're not perfect here. As a matter of fact, you come to church here long enough, you'll realize we're pretty jacked up. But we're jacked up for Jesus. And so if you've messed up, this is a place for you. We are all forgiven sinners, and you can receive forgiveness here, amen? And let's not forget that repentance requires action, friends. Repentance requires action. Which leads me to the third and final worldview that I think stands in literal opposition to this world. And it's the sanctity of marriage. Somebody say marriage. God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman for life. That is God's intended design. Anytime I bring this up, people will always ask the question, well, what about all the polygamy in the Bible? Listen, believers in God back then were stupid just like we are. Not everything reported in the Bible is affirmed by the Bible. The thing that I love about Scripture, though, is it shows God's incredible story with humanity and his grace and mercy and forgiveness, but it also very clearly shows the consequences when we live outside of God's original design. In Matthew 19, 4 to 6, Jesus reaffirms the sanctity of marriage. Jesus says, from the beginning, the creator made male and female. This is the reason a man is to leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I'm going to get ready to close with this, Erica, if you want to come up. Listen, there are many issues where people of goodwill disagree, but these issues are clear and non-negotiable. Well, who says? God says. I, I am preaching 0% opinion today, I promise you. 
I, I went through with a fine-tooth comb this week to make sure that my stupidity does not get in the way of what God's word clearly says. If you're going to claim to be a Christian, you need God's worldview and the boldness to stand for it. Listen, one of the reasons why this message was on my heart to preach to you today is because it's a presidential election year. And these years are crazy. Anybody agree with that? Like, I'm thinking they're probably going to release killer hornets that carry COVID squared that hack into your bank account this year. I have no idea what's going to happen this year. But literally, every election year, pastors go, let's see what happens this year. Last election year was crazy. Some of that was because of political nonsense, and some of it was just the reality of where our world is right now. But what I want to tell you is God never changes. And his word never changes. And you know that I will never endorse a candidate and I will never tell you who to vote for as your pastor. As a matter of fact, I'm registered independent so that I can minister to all sides. But as your pastor, let me give you this advice. Please take this sincerely. You and I need to vote with our worldview because everybody else does. We need to vote with our worldview. Well, how do I know the worldview of a candidate that is running for any office. It's very simple. Read the party platform that he or she promises to support. You can go and find that platform. You could see the worldview that they have and the things that they're supporting and the agenda that they're pushing. As a matter of fact, you can listen to speeches even in the last several weeks and you can see exactly where candidates stand on even some of the issues that I'm preaching about today. And friends, I will make a bold statement. I will never cast a vote for someone who completely disregards God's laws and who pushes a worldly agenda. And I think as a believer in Jesus, you should not either. Now that being said, I don't care who you vote for, that's your business. I'm here to minister to everyone on all sides. We're not a political nonsense church, we don't do that stuff. But what I will say is, man, me following Jesus matters a whole lot. And you following Jesus matters a whole lot. And I wanna close with this today. How can I stand fearlessly bold in God's truth in my life? How can I make sure, let's just hone in on this for just a moment as we end our time together. How can I make sure that I am living fearlessly bold for God's word in a time and an era that doesn't value God's word? Because friends, we need to believe that God's word is authoritative. It is literally what we build our life upon. So how can I stand fearlessly bold in God's truth? Number one, accept God's word as my authority. It is the only source that will never lie to you. God's word is always true. It always has been and it always will be. And his word is still relevant today, thousands of years later with the Old Testament and a couple thousand year, years later with the New Testament. His words are, in my, are almost more relevant today when you compare it to culture. Friends, God's word has to be our authority. Our denomination is not our authority. Our political affiliation is not our authority. Our chubby pastor is not our authority. God's word is our authority. I will mention to you, his word does say that I'm supposed to be your shepherd. But God's word is our authority. Hebrews 6.18 God has given us both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can take new courage, for we can hold on to his promises with confidence. Here's a big truth for you. You will either listen to the world or you will listen to the word of God. So I need to accept God's word as my authority. Second thing, if we want to live a bold life, I need to spend personal time with Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. Come on, I need to spend time with Jesus. You need to spend time with Jesus. We need to have some time where we allow the King of kings and Lord of lords to speak into our hearts so that we are with him. In Acts 4, 13, after incredible things had happened through the disciples and the apostles, this was said in Acts 4, 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and could see that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Listen, Susie, I don't know if your name's Susie. I'm sure you're wonderful. Next time you walk into Walmart, Susie, make sure you've been spending time with Jesus at home. 
What would it be like if we walked up to the cashier and we were checking out at Walmart and we were just being a Jesus following, Jesus loving, crazy person and you walked down and they said, man, that person must have been hanging out with Jesus. What would happen if after church we went out and actually radically loved those that disagree with us and they said, man, those people have been hanging out with Jesus. Acts 4, 31 says, after they had prayed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke God's word without fear. You know what one of the biggest reasons why we should come to church is? Because this is the place of sanity that preaches the word of God and fills us up with boldness so that we can go out and live in a world that stands against us. We need this today. Are you fired up today, church? You're not as fired up as I am today, church. Are we fired up today, church? On our campuses today, are we fired up today? Saying, man, I know what God's word says, and I'm ready to live for it. Listen, by the way, I'm not asking you to go out and be a jerk. Well, my pastor said that you guys are all going to hell. It's not really what we're looking for today. What we're looking for is for you to be certain about what you believe and why you believe it. And to stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The truth of God's word says no matter what I'm facing, no matter how crazy this world becomes, no matter what kind of crazy killer hornet COVID carrying things they throw at us this year in election year, is that I'm standing firm with the truth of God's word buckled around my soul saying I am not going to give up on what God has for me. Amen. So I close with this. Remember as we stand in truth to lead with love. So incredibly important. We need to know how to speak to people who disagree with us. I talk to a lot of people that disagree with me a lot more than you probably think I do. And literally one of the things that I say, I want to give you this, is I go, hey, thank you so much for sharing where you're coming from. I want you to know that I'm hearing you and I'm understanding what you're saying. But I think it's very important for you to know and to hear me that I don't agree with what you're saying, nor do I support it. That being said, though, I am absolutely still willing to talk to you on a respectful level and to honor your decision-making in your life. How different could our conversations look if we said that? Did I justify anything they're saying? No. I disagree with them harder than most of us ever do when we're yelling at people. But I said it in a way that's very respectful and honoring. We need to learn how to do this, church. We need to lead with love as we stand for truth. Amen? Would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and to worship and to bow down at your feet. Lord, I pray that you would give us a courage. Lord, I'm, I'm preaching about all kinds of hard subjects today. And Lord, I know that you place this on our heart for today, for such a moment in time as this. But Lord, forget about what I have to say. Lord, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak a fresh word to your people through the power of your anointing today. God, help us to walk out of here, Lord, feeling fired up for you, Lord God. Lord, as the disciples and the apostles, as they would get together and pray, and the Bible says that the ground they were standing on would be shaken and they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. May we walk out of this place being shaken to our core and filled with the Holy Spirit to stand up for what is right in a culture that wants to do wrong, God. Lord, I thank you that we can love those who disagree with us. We can love those who hate us. But, Lord, we can also stand firm and know that we're not the only ones that are fighting this good fight. Lord, there are many others just like us who know you and know your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you take every word that was spoken today, lock it in with us, God, and change our hearts and minds to follow you more clearly. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, if you could honestly say today, maybe you need a little more boldness in your life. If that's you today, you're like, Pastor, you know, I, I just need to be more bold on the things that I believe. I need to be more certain about the worldview that I carry. I need to be more understanding of what God's word says so that I can stand for it in a greater measure. If that's you, just slip up your hand right where you're at. Whatever campus you're on today, just say, Pastor, yes, pray for me. I want to be more bold in my life as I follow and pursue Jesus something about this. Thank you for your honesty today. A lot of us saying, yeah, you could put your hand down. Second thing, maybe you'd say, you know, pastor, I don't have a, a real relationship with Jesus. I want you to know that the most important thing 
about our Christian worldview is the idea that God sent his one and only son to die in place of us and because of us. Friends, as I'm preaching today, talking about things that are wrong in our culture, (laughs) friends, God sent his son to die to make our hearts right as we repent from the things that we've done that are wrong. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God, excuse me, if we confess in our heart, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus died and God rose from the dead, that we shall be saved. I like to think about that and pause and think about what that means to believe about Jesus in our heart and to confess with our mouth with boldness what we believe. And some of you need to do just that today, to confess that faith that has been stirring in your soul today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to count to three and ask you if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior or if you want to come back to him and stand boldly for him in this time as a disciple of Jesus. One, it's the greatest decision you could ever make. Two, I want you to know that God has a plan for you and loves you and wants you to come to himself and I will not embarrass you or call you out today. This is between you and him. Three, just throw up your hand right where you're at today. Say, Pastor, that's me today. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. Six, is there anybody else? Say, Pastor, would you pray for me today? Seven, is there anybody else? Eight, is there anybody else? Nine, is there anybody else? I want you to know at the campuses today, God sees you. He knows if you're slipping up your hand right now, he sees that as well. Why don't we just repeat this prayer with boldness after me, if you will. Just say, dear Jesus, I believe in you and your holy word. I ask you today to become my Lord and my Savior. I believe, Jesus, that you died and rose again. I choose today to follow you for all the days of my life. Help me to be bold, to live for you, and to accept your word as ultimate truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, let's hear it for Jesus today. He is good. Amen. Amen. I want to mention to you, uh, I don't have a message quite like today on the docket for quite a while um, because I don't really enjoy like getting up here and going, let's talk about how jacked up the world is. I would rather help us follow Jesus in a greater way, but I think it's so important that we clarify where we're standing because this world is getting crazier and crazier. We're seeing it across the board. Even in Christianity, things are getting crazier and crazier and crazier, and we need to clarify what we believe and why about God's word. And the most important thing is God's holy word is ultimate truth, and this is what we stand on. Amen? Amen. I want to transition on our campuses. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. And here at Cedra Woolley, Pastor Mike and Trace, you're going to come up and tell us a few of the great things that are going on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Josh. How many of you are loving this Fearless series? I love it that our pastor, our shepherd, can preach life-applicable, encouraging, biblical message. It's just great. And he did a duck face. I don't know. <laughs> and also talked about MySpace, but that was that was awesome. Anyways, uh, just as a reminder, next Sunday at 1 p.m. at our Cedar Woolley campus, we are having our annual business meeting. You do not have to be a member to come join us, but you do have to be a member to vote. So anyways, um, that's next Sunday at 1 p.m. Free lunch, too. Like, we I mean, always, always have food. Always have food. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you are a youth in the building or you feel like you're a youth inside, oh. uh, next Friday we have a Mario Kart tournament right Woo! here. From what I understand, it's going to be on the big screen, maybe. Um, so that'll be at 5 p.m. on Friday. So if you have youth, get them to that. They'll have a lot of fun, and it'll be a great time. I feel like I should be here to, like... Like chaperone it or something like that. That was my game back in the day. I love Mario Kart. Love me some Mario Kart. That'll be fun. What an awesome thing for you. And then also, as you know, Easter is coming. We have some cards in the back you can grab. Start thinking about those. And and yes, it's just right around the corner. corner. Yeah, and we have our annual Easter egg hunt. It's a big deal for the kids. It's my grandkids' favorite thing about our (laughs) church. We give away thousands of eggs. But anyways, uh, yeah, so start praying and think about people who you can invite. Would you guys stand? And Pastor Mike, would you pray these lovely people out? Yeah, 
I'd love to pray a blessing over you guys if you guys will stand with me. Father God, we just thank you that God, your word, that it is speaking to our hearts. I pray yeah. that it would plant seeds yes. of truth in us. I pray this yes. week that every person in this room would experience your love and your grace and your mercy. Yes. I pray that God, as we go from here, I pray we would be a blessing to this world <laughs> to show the love of Jesus yeah. to those who are far from you. Yeah. We pray a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have, Have a, a great, great week, week, everybody. We'll see you next week.